What a pleasure to be here. Merci, Lionel, and uh, Christina, for your invitation. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of an event uh, with so many distinguished guests, including the three fellow members of my panel. Thank you, Mishana and Chad, for your presentations. And Joanna, I look forward to yours as well. I have a preface uh, to my talk on Lynn Riggs. Lynn Riggs was in France from August 1928 to April 1929. During that time, he wrote his most famous play, outside of Native American and Indigenous studies, I mean, Green Grow the Lilacs. And he also conceived of the Cherokee Night. He wrote letters back to his editor, Barrett Clark, about how the play was fermenting as he spent time writing in uh, Canyon sur mer uh, on the French Riviera. He also mostly uh, spent his time in, in Paris and in St. Jean de Luz and then um, Canyon sur mer uh, as far as I know, he did not come to um, Bordeaux. Um, Lynn Riggs and the Art of Citizenship. When Oklahoma became a state in November 1907, following dramatic land loss from allotment and land runs, it precipitated what one Cherokee woman called a dark age. Or to Cherokee Nation scholar Kirby Brown, a more than six decade long chaotic period for the nation and its citizens. Cherokee Nation playwright Lynn Riggs captures the social, cultural, and political chaos in his play, The Cherokee Night, most explicitly in a scene in which the young Gar Breeden finds himself captured by members of a religious cult. Gar explains his unwelcome presence to the cult leader. He says, no place for me anywhere. Come down to Tahlequah yesterday to see if, to see, I thought this being the head of, listen, I'm half Cherokee. I thought they could help me out here. I thought they, old men sitting in the square, no tribe to go to, no council to help me out of the kind of trouble I'm in, nothing to count on. The post-statehood dissolution of the Cherokee Nation's government has left Gar feeling stateless and nationless. Riggs dramatizes in this scene a shared and predictable experience for Cherokees of this era, for as Cherokee Nation scholar Katie Walkowitz explains, statehood was a method for producing geopolities where black and native people did not belong. Because statehood reifies white masculinist control, Walkowitz observes, inclusion in the state requires that native peoples deny their indigeneity, stateless, and with his indigeneity, his Cherokeeness, in danger of erasure, Gar must, again drawing on Wakowitz, make room to imagine other spatial relations, turn toward untied states rather than united states. Riggs was born a citizen of the Cherokee Nation in 1899 and became a citizen of the United States, and therefore a dual national, by a special act of Congress in 1901 the same year that his Cherokee mother, Rose Ella Buster, died. But he practiced and theorized other spatial relations and other forms of community once he left the Indian territory of his childhood in the young state of Oklahoma for Santa Fe, in the even younger state of New Mexico, in the fall of 1923. In his peripatetic adult life, he established a network of friends and collaborators in the arts in places such as Santa Fe, Hollywood, Provincetown, and New York City. Riggs found the most satisfying experience of belonging within this community of artists, especially those working in the little theater movement and those writing about race and racism in the United States and those holding progressive political positions on race, gender, and sexuality. Within this community, he practiced and later theorized a kind of aspirational citizenship. The people in his built community supported each other personally professionally and financially, and collaborated on works of art. Indeed, though Riggs first succeeded as a poet, with his poems first appearing in national magazines like The Smart Set in 1922, Harriet Monroe's Poetry, excuse me, in 1923, and The Nation in 1926, he chose the collaborative world of the theater over life as a poet. 
Riggs' life as a gay Cherokee dramatist provides a compelling and for the period an anomalous answer to an enduring question in Native American and Indigenous studies. How does an Indigenous person respond when statehood and U.S. citizenship erase, or aspire to erase, belonging to a tribal nation, enforce the denial of one's indigeneity, and require Native people, among others, to endure various forms of ex exclusion, segregation, isolation, suppression of voting rights, racial violence, etc. Lucy Maddox, Beth Piatode, and Kiara Vigil have studied the tribal, national, and U.S. citizenship of indigenous people in the so-called progressive era, during which Riggs grew into young adulthood, began his career as a poet and dramatist, and saw the production of the Indian Territory set plays Big Lake and Roadside, the first two of his six plays that appeared on Broadway. All three scholars view performance as a crucial component of indigenous experiences of and claims to citizenship. Formatics, indigenous public intellectuals or citizen Indians performed on the literal as well as the figurative stages of American public life through strategic moves as a way of both inserting their embodied selves into the national consciousness and establishing their claim to a place on those stages. V. Hill shares this view while also accounting for writing as a performance. Indigenous intellectuals, V. Hill says, sought to claim the rights of American citizenship so that they might more productively intervene in the body politic. They did so by participating in pan-tribal alliances and networks. Piato considers indigenous experiences of citizenship during the assimilation period, which encompasses the progressive era, within the context of their legal status as domestic subjects, a category, quoting Piato, in opposition to American citizenship, within but not of the settler nation. In this context, the indigenous home becomes, again quoting Piato, the locus through which Indian families and nations have expressed resistance. To Maddox, V. Hill, and Piato, these are the features of indigenous experiences of U.S. citizenship in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Seeking or trying to establish a claim to U.S. citizenship, often from a pan-tribal position, resisting from the tribal national domestic space the forces that shape individuals into U.S. citizen. Riggs takes an approach that diverges from these three conceptions of citizenship, one that leans towards practicing citizenship in a community outside of the family and tribal nation, rather than performing U.S. citizenship or resisting its demands, though in some cases that's implicit. Riggs performed publicly on occasion, but unlike fellow Cherokee Will Rogers, he preferred to stay behind the scenes, I look forward to hearing a little bit more about Will Rogers from Joshua Nelson uh, later uh, in the conference, too. Riggs did not seek to join or to build a pan-tribal network of supporters and collaborators. He was too young, for example, to participate in the Society of American Indians. And he left his own Cherokee home as a young adult and spent his adult life constantly moving through a series of temporary residences. He wrote roles for indigenous, Cherokee, Mayan, and Pueblo characters in his plays, though, and he created a role for himself in the theater and the spaces that supported it. The homes of other artists and dramatists, university classrooms and theaters and local arts clubs and radio stations. Indigeneity in his plays has received attention from scholars as representing efforts to resist the US or to cope with and condemn histories of state violence. But Riggs, the working artist, aspiring social reformer, and within his community, openly gay man, lived a remarkably different life than Charles Alexander Eastman, Gertrude Bonin, Luther Standing Bear, Carlos Montezuma, and other indigenous public figures that dominate the scholarship in Native American and indigenous studies before the Native American Renaissance beginning in the late 1960s. Riggs cultivated and attended to the health of his community of artists across US state and national borders, settler national borders. It did not require territory, but artistic spaces on the page and in playhouses, cinemas, classrooms, and private homes. Riggs thrived in these spaces, and despite two purchases of his own private property, his own territory, he resisted becoming tied to these small plots of land in favor of the temporary spaces of friends' homes, apartments, hotels, and theaters. While the nearly constant movement uh, during his life across state lines and through safe artistic spaces 
might resemble the kind of living favored by other artists. The history of removal and state creation that Walkowitz describes in her book, Reading Territory, and that Cherokee Nation scholars such as Kirby Brown, Daniel Heath Justice, and Joshua Nelson, both in the room with us, consider in various critical and political contexts, launches Riggs on this path and provides a framework for understanding the deep integration of his personal and professional lives and the socially transformative theater world that he theorized in his talks and in his letters. I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through the uh, part set in Norman, Oklahoma, and Hollywood. So Riggs did start to build a community of creative people for himself and to bind them together with his writing and musical talent at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, for example, he met Joseph Benton, um, later the famous uh, opera singer Giuseppe Bentonelli. Uh, he met Benton uh, at Norman. Uh, and uh, went on a singing tour with him and actually ended up living in the Benton home for most of his time while he was at the University of Oklahoma. He joined the Blue Pencil Literary Society at Oklahoma. He met Walter S. Campbell or Stanley Vestal, an English professor and writer primarily on indigenous topics and to whom I will return a little later in this talk. He also met uh, Vachel Lindsay, who just happens to be from my hometown, Springfield, Illinois, when Lindsay came to do a poetry reading uh, on campus. And he wrote Lindsay a poem after he left, uh, called appropriately to Vachel Lindsay. And this poem is, in my understanding, an early example of how consistently throughout his career, Riggs uses art to forge belonging. In this case, in the poem, he imagines a shared space of belonging. There are pilgrims in a caravan. And he links that imaginative, imagined community to a poet with whom he recently crossed paths, because in the poem, Lindsay is a fountain in the distance. He also met Binner right after he met Lindsay. Um, Witter Binner uh, also came to do a poetry reading uh, at the University of Oklahoma, and it was Binner who suggested uh, to Riggs uh, that he come to Santa Fe. And he eventually did leave the University of Oklahoma and arrived in Santa Fe to a thriving artist's colony called by historian Jordan Walters a formative queer community. This is the community that welcomed him in Santa Fe. There he quickly became friends with Ida Rao, uh, participant in the Provincetown Players, famously also an activist for women's rights. She ended up directing his first play, Knives from Syria. Now I'll pick back up to the main thread. So this collaboration with Ida Rao led to a long friendship and professional relationship between the two, between Riggs and Rao, I mean. And it was Rao who connected Riggs to the theater world and his future agent, Barrett Clark of Samuel French, on the East Coast. After spending uh, time in France in 1928 and 1929 on a Guggenheim Fellowship, Riggs returned and went to live with Rao at her home in Provincetown on Cape Cod. He spent several more summers there in the early 1930s and crossed paths with Susan Glasspool, uh, the dramatist, among other writers. He grew so close to Rao that he gave her his seat for opening night of Russet Mantle which premiered on Broadway on January 16th, 1936 at Theater Mask and played longer than Green Grow the Lilacs, by the way. Russet Mantle was his most um, well-attended, the longest-running Broadway play, not Green Grow the Lilacs. Riggs' first collaboration, other than his plays, had its roots in the effort to bring Knives from Syria to the stage, the aforementioned first play produced in Santa Fe and then Albuquerque. Christine Hughes, a local patron of the arts, produced Knives, her son, James, or Jimmy Hughes, had an interest in filmmaking. With Riggs, Jimmy Hughes made A Day in Santa Fe, a silent city symphony film set in Santa Fe and the nearby Santa Clara Pueblo. Riggs and Hughes made the film in August 1931 and screened it at La Fonda on the Plaza in Santa Fe on January 6, 1932. A Day in Santa Fe captures visually and intimately two communities, Santa Fe with its Mexican-American, Anglo, and indigenous residents and visitors, and Santa Clara Pueblo where Riggs and Hughes filmed an annual harvest dance. With the involvement of Jimmy Hughes, 
shots from the roof of Witterbinner's home, at the swimming pool at the estate of sisters Elizabeth and Martha White, scenes of Alice Corbin Henderson writing a poem in Joseph Bacco's painting, and passages from Riggs' own poem Santo Domingo Corn Dance on some of the title cards. A Day in Santa Fe demonstrates another early version of Riggs' effort to claim and reinforce his own belonging in a community through artistic collaboration. And here we are in Hollywood. All I'm, I'm going to say about Hollywood is he wrote for Pathé, MGM, RKO, Samuel Goldman, Paramount, and Universal, at least. Uh, and after he left, because he didn't really enjoy his time much in Hollywood, they kept writing to him, begging him to help Dr. Scripps. In any case, his time in Hollywood was important because he connected with a lot of actors, many of whom eventually came east to act in his plays. And also, he introduced certain actors to Hollywood that eventually had really fantastic Hollywood careers. I'll just mention um, Academy Award winner Harold Hecht, Francho Tone, and Tex Ritter, um, and Anthony Quinn uh, as, as well. So the work in Hollywood did give him some financial stability, but he was never entirely happy living in Hollywood. For example, at 6650 Franklin Avenue in the Montecito Apartments um, and working for the studios. In late 1933, he purchased a lot in Santa Fe and built a house on it. This effort to establish a permanent home did not make Riggs any less restless, though. He lived there irregularly, very irregularly, actually, as he continued to make trips to California, New York, North Carolina, and Mexico, and to cities and college campuses to oversee productions of his plays. He sold the house in 1940 and did not own, a, own another home until 1947, when he purchased one for himself and his partner, the dancer Guy Machado, in Shelter Island, New York. As he moved from residence to residence, he worked to sustain the relationships in his community and connect people within it to each other. His correspondence with the aforementioned Walter Campbell, to take a representative example, reveals Riggs's, Riggs talking about his plays, sending Campbell a collection of poems. Rhythm of Rain, proposing to bring one of Campbell's manuscripts to the members of his new poetry club in Santa Fe, and commenting on the same manuscript himself in three and a half handwritten pages, and sharing the reflections of poetry club member Haniel Long. There's a lot of work going on here, establishing bonds and reinforcing them. He also reports on his new friend Willard Spud Johnson's literary magazine, Laughing Horse, and gossips about Campbell with Alice Corbin Henderson. Campbell, in turn, was working on a feature about Whit Riggs for the Southwest Review. It was published, still available. Like so much of Riggs's correspondence, these letters show him preserving ties, introducing the people in his artistic circles to each other, and organizing his friends into formal groups with artistic goals. His letters to fellow playwright Paul Green, winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 1927 for his play In Abraham's Bosom, follow the exact same pattern. Riggs also sent Green, in letter form, a proposal for a new kind of theater that retroactively demonstrates Riggs' approach to the intimate merging of personal and professional relationships into an untied state, to recall Wachowicz, or a deterritorialized space of belonging. In a 17-page letter dated 5 March 1939, Riggs presents the Vine Theater as a multi-ethnic, multinational collaboration with Andreas Jelinski, Mary Hunter, this is Mary Hunter Austin's niece, and his romantic partner, Riggs's romantic partner, I mean, Ramon Naya, with the group seeking Paul Green's participation because we not unite in a common love for you. The letter contains the outline of this new theater as a body of theater, that's a quote from Riggs, a body of theater, on which Riggs expects the participants will continue to work. The participants will build the theater from our correspondence, he writes, while we are also widely separated, our Russian and our Irish American being in New York, our Mexican in Mexico, our white man in the South, and our red Cherokee in New Mexico. Riggs conceptualizes the theater, the Vine Theater, as a union, thinking of what Chad was just saying about student unions right now, too. The members are united, 
in their love for Paul Green. And this is a union that connects them across three U.S. states, four if you include Oklahoma, and two countries, but four if you include the Cherokee Nation, as I think we should, and Russia, and maybe even five because Jelinski worked for years in Lithuania in the theater there as well. The Vine Theater will transform people, Riggs explains, not by educating them, but by creating a space for them to share an experience. The theater, I'm quoting now, will be a place of creation, not of destruction. In the world today, forces in opposition to the triumphant, arrogant state are demolished by pogrom, by discriminatory laws, and the other tools of inhumanity and cruelty. Such a world demands change. Again, quoting from the letter, the way to change the world is to offer such a living and singing force that all people in whom the germ of truth resides, however deeply, will be drawn and changed by an instinctive need to ally themselves with life instead of death. In hindsight, Riggs had long followed this program. He had aligned himself as friend and collaborator with artists and activists, Ida Rao, Alice Corbin Henderson, writers like Paul Green committed to addressing systemic racism in their work, trailblazers, Mary Hunter, later Mary Hunter Wolf, became one of the first women to direct a play on Broadway, and then also the innovative Mexican-born dancer and choreographer Jose Limon, with whom Riggs collaborated on We Speak for Ourselves, a poem in dance performed while both served in the army in Virginia during the Second World War. Riggs did decline offers to collaborate, I should say, including one by Sidney Lumet and another by Otto Preminger. Like any borders, the ones around his extra-tribal, extra-national community required maintenance. He had found his people from romantic partners like Naya, a painter and a playwright, and Machado, a dancer in Limon's troupe, to supporters like Rao and Clark and Green, to collaborators like Hughes and Naya again, because they wrote a play together, and Limon, among many others. As he struggled with stomach cancer in the months before he died, Riggs stayed in Chapel Hill with French-born Jacques Hardry and William H. Baskin III, both of them professors of French and friends that he met through Green. He visited with Green during this trip too, years after Riggs' death. In fact, Green was still trying to find a publisher for Riggs' collection of poems, Hamlet not the only. When Riggs returned to New York, he left his Shelter Island home for the last time and entered the hospital. Rao, who had spent time with Riggs during the previous year at Shelter Island, Spud Johnson and his sister, Maddie Riggs Cundiff, visited. As reported by Bronlick, Riggs had asked Johnson to look at houses for him in Taos. And I want to share this last um, anecdote uh, because the end of Riggs's life uh, is often figured as sad and lonely. And I, what I wanted to say is that it was not at all, in fact. People cite the fact that only these three people came to visit him. He didn't tell people how sick he was. There was no way they could have gotten there. But these three figured out how to get there. So Riggs wanted an update because he was thinking about moving back to uh, Taos or moving back to northern New Mexico. He wanted an update, and Johnson, according to Bronlick, quote, going along with this charade, like someone in a dream, described a charming old house in an area where some of their mutual friends lived. For a gay Cherokee man who had spent his life in a community of artists, in which the citizenship requirements included imagination, creativity, a desire to collaborate, and a belief in art, drama, poetry, dance, painting, as socially transformative, it was a beautiful vision, and Riggs died the next morning. Thanks.